Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather. This is the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We acknowledge the many nations that walk this land in the past and the many nations that walk this land today. My name is Tashana Reed and I'm a senior reporter with CBC News. I'm so excited to be here tonight for the official launch of Perdita Felicien's memoir, My Mother's Daughter. She is an Olympian, a world-class champion, a TV host, and now she can add the title of author to her long list of accomplishments. Now, before we get started, let's take a look at some of Perdita's career highlights. Perdita Felicien is a two-time world champion, a two-time Olympian, and a 10-time Canadian national champion. She is the only woman in Canadian history to ever win a gold medal at the World Track and Field Championships. During her career as a 100-meter hurdler, she earned numerous honors, including Canada's Female Athlete of the Year, Keys to the City of Pickering, and the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal. Perdita retired from professional sport in 2013 and is now an author, a television host, a sports broadcaster, and a motivational speaker. Inducted into Athletics Canada's Hall of Fame in 2016, she is the host of the new TV series, All Round Champion. She has covered multiple international sporting events, including the 2016 Summer Olympics in Brazil 
in the 2018 Olympic Winter Games in South Korea for the CBC. Perdita is an advocate for multiple humanitarian organizations, including the Denise House, the Women's Emergency Shelter in Durham Region that she credits with helping her family get on their feet in the late 1980s. Perdita has recently written her first book, My Mother's Daughter Chronicles the Highs and Lows of Her Illustrious Racing Career, as well as her experience with homelessness and being a child witness to domestic abuse. Please welcome Perdita Felician. You look so good. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited that you're here. This is your day. Yes. <laughs> Publication day is here. We were supposed to do this a year ago. Yes, we were. We had plans, a live audience. Yeah. It was going to look a lot different. But of mm. course, a pandemic was declared. Stupid COVID. Yes. <laughs> but a year later, we are here. Yeah. So how does it feel to be here for the launch of your memoir? I feel relieved. I mean, I was like, I can't just do this in my office on a Zoom call. <laughs> I cannot Zoom call this book. I will not. And I thought, why not bring this to life in the best way possible, considering COVID, like you said. And my dream has just become a reality. An amazing team behind the scenes helped pull this off. And uh, it's perfect. It's exactly what I want to usher this memoir into the world. It looks amazing. I mean, let's talk about this set for a second. Let's, <laughs> right. let's take this in. Yeah. It's vibrant. It's beautiful. What was your vision? What was your inspiration? It's a nod to the book, the spine of the book. There was so much consideration that went into the cover of this book. So many conversations back and forth, and we finally nailed it last year. And the spine is really just a nod to my mother's heritage and the flowers that are part of St. Lucian culture. Um, it's also a nod to what's in the book, right? The textures, the colors, the vibrancy, the life, right? And for me, this is just bringing all of those things to life in a very just uh, tangible way. So, you know, let's dive right in. Yeah. I don't want to give too much away to yeah. our readers, but, uh, <sighs> Why did you want to write a memoir? Yeah. You know what? I didn't know all the pieces of my mother's story. And I really, when I started learning them as I was growing up, I was like, Mom, you're incredible. How did you do this? Why did you leave your country? Wait, you met a rich couple and you were a teenager and you came to Canada and they, it was a lot. And so I thought, I need to know what this story is. And it wasn't until I retired from sport in around 2013 that I put it together in this book. Oral history, conversations, research. Um, and I knew that sometimes we celebrate you know, rich people or people who have like name recognition, and not the everyday heroes in our midst. My mom literally changed the trajectory of my life and generations to come after, and that is a story worth telling. Tell me a bit about the writing process because yeah. this is your first book. What was that like? No ghost writer here. Let me just tell y'all, <laughs> no ghost writer. Oh, all my thoughts. And it was really important to me to be the author of this story because I, I didn't trust in anybody else's hands because I lived it. I knew the emotion of it. Mm -hmm. And so I could have sat in a room and, and told it to someone who's written lots of books. But to me, no, I lived it and I could tell that story. So it took four years to write it. I went to the University of Chicago Bleacher Center creative writing program for two years. So I got a certificate in creative writing. I like to plug that. And for me, it was I wanted to do the story justice. I break some rules in my memoir, right? Because I take you back to before I was born. So I really had to recreate a time when I wasn't ar around. And so it is really a story of oral history, but going back and reading archives and newspapers to really see what was this time like? Why would a couple ask my mother, who's a teenager, to come and take care of their children in Oshawa? No kind of experience doing that, what was going on. And so I reconstruct what was happening you know, in their lives that really made this possible. But it took calling people, you know, hours and hours of researching. And uh, in the end, I'm really proud of this story. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, you know, you share a whole other side of your life, as you mentioned, and beyond the achievements, beyond the accolades. Uh, it, why did you want to take people there? Yeah. You know what? I could have just told you my sports story. I could have taken you to Athens, which I do. I could have taken you to Paris in 03 when I won the world, which I do. And those are the great stories. But I knew um, the story is divided into parts, three parts. And I could never just write a sports story. That's not what this is. Because I feel like the foundation of my life is really my mother's story. And her story made mine possible. She basically has a grade six education, had a grade six education at the time. And she had to stop going to school as a little girl so she could sell on the beach to tourists, most of them white, most of them affluent, so that she could help her, her family make a living. Um, and by chance, she sees this, this couple and approaches them and asks them to babysit their little three-month-old. And that created this it created why I'm here, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so I'm like, how can I tell the sports story if you don't understand where I came from and how that foundation made me the athlete that I am and the woman that I am? So her story is my story, and I weave the two stories together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are some really challenging moments in this story that you revisit. Yeah. You write about your family's experience with domestic violence and abuse. Yeah. You touch on your first experiences with racism yeah. in this country. What were the most difficult parts to write? Goodness, I would write in circles, right? It took me, like I said, four years to write this book. So Athens was really hard to talk about. Um, my father putting my mother out in the middle of the night was really difficult to write about. And, um, you know, the childhood memories of my childhood, like neighborhood in Oshawa, Ontario, they were easy and great to write about, right? Because they really um, were beautiful memories. But finally, when there's nothing else to write after two and a half years and those hard memories that I have of my dad and kind of the complicated way I view him, I had to face that on the page. And I cried. My mom and I cried. Um, I felt bad about him. He's still alive. He's still around. And I felt, what happens when dad reads this? What happens when he sees this? And the fact that my memoir will contain some of my earliest memories and they involve him and they're not good memories, right? Mm -hmm. So that was difficult to face. And even to right now, I don't know that I've reconciled that in my mind because I know it will hurt him reading this on the page. Mm -hmm. I, I am going to come back to that point. You, you mentioned um, yeah. writing about your father. But back to your mother. I mean, we are going to meet yeah. her. She's an incredible yeah. woman. She's in the background somewhere waiting. <laughs> She's hanging out. She's she ready. She looks amazing. Yeah. Uh, but so much, as you, as you mentioned, of your story is rooted in her story. This memoir intertwines both of your lives. Um, yeah. Why did you want to do that with your memoir? Yeah. You know what? I think um, it's such an incredible story. I didn't know all of this story as a teenager. Um, my mom's life of having to... Um, grow up in St. Lucia and not having a lot. I knew that. But my mom would say things to me as I grew up. I'm 40 years old now. But, you know, imagine being 9 and 13 and 19 and your mom saying, P, when you came into this world, you gave me hope. Now, I'm 9, I'm 10, I'm 12. I'm just, I just care about my dolls. I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. But then as I got older and she would say that, it was really loaded for me because I'm like, well, what was your life like? Like, what kind of hope did I give you? And I didn't realize that my mom was referencing the fact that she came to this country, had nothing, no status, no paper. And ha I wasn't planned, right? You'll re that is revealed in the book. I was not planned. And she has to make the decision on whether she keeps me. Because to keep me in a country where she has absolutely no, um, no foundation means her life will be harder. Now, if she gets rid of me quietly, which is her right as a woman, then her climb to where she wants to go in Canada is a little bit easier. And so my mom had to make that decision. I didn't know all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I, I re realized as a teenager, I wasn't planned. I mean, aren't we all planned? Like, don't we are we all really wanted? And it was different for my mother. And so for me, I wanted to tell that story because I'm like, look what this woman has created. Look what she's done. And so it informed me as I raised Tashana. I'll be honest with you, knowing that this I was not going to make her ashamed. I was going to only make her proud because I was her witness to what she, mm -hmm. she lived through, the hardship, the homelessness. And I was going to make her proud. And this story hopefully makes her proud. Okay, well, I think it's time that we actually meet your Yay. mother. The audience definitely wants to meet your mom. So uh, let's welcome Ms. Catherine Felician Brown to the stage. Hi. Yay. Oh, 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 oh. Hey, hey, hey. It is so good to meet Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. So Hi, good to see you. Thank you both you. look lovely. And Thank you. Just the bond between both of you, it's just, it's so beautiful to Thanks. see and to read about in this, um, in this book. Uh, Ms. Kathy, you are your daughter's number one cheerleader, her fiercest supporter. Mm -hmm. So how does it feel to, you know, sit here with her as she, you know, launches her memoir? Excuse me. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful feeling. Mm -hmm. I never thought that I would have seen this day. But through God and the love of her and the rest of my children, that I am happy to be here. I'm sitting next to her. <laughs> Come a little closer. I feel like you're far. Come a little closer, <laughs> Mama. So we can have a good cry together if we need to. Mm -hmm. If we need to have a good cry. There's tissue. Yes. You need it. Yes. On hand. I am very happy to be around her, and she makes me proud. I love you, Mama. And I love you more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in many ways, you are at the center of this story. So w what did you think when you first read it? I didn't, um, I had started reading it, but it was so emotional, I had to put it down. Because it was so painful to me to reading all what I went through. And it was bringing back all the memories. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I had to put it down. Yeah. Which I didn't know. Um, 
because I remember we're preparing for obviously like talking about the book and all the things that happened and of course it's been delayed a year so I went to talk to her and I didn't realize she told me like when I get to the hard parts I skip over them I didn't mm -hmm. realize that it was still painful for her to go back and read it on the page and that's something that you haven't you haven't read the complete book so no. there's there's that mm -hmm. it is good mom it's really good <laughs> well I want to ask you Ms. Kathy about this photo this photo right here on the cover of the book can you take me back to this day? Do you remember when this was taken? Yes. Um, I um, was um, working as a um, domestic, looking after a lady. I was doing live-in with her. And then um, some photographers came over to her house to, to take out the picture, but she wasn't feeling too well. So she asked me if I can have the picture taken. I was surprised <laughs> because, you know, I didn't know much about it. So um, I said, no problem at all. So I asked the photographer if um, he can give me half an hour to get ready, because I didn't prepare, I didn't know about it. So um, they said, no problem. So Polita was home with me. So I called Polita, I said, well, we're going to have our picture taken. So I went and I get, my, get her ready first. And then I get myself ready, put a little makeup on her face, make her look good. Well, I shot on my face, a little makeup, <laughs> a lot of makeup. Okay, let's be honest. 1986, stand up, please. Keep going. So I dress her up and make her look good. Mm -hmm. And then I went through the living room and then they had a picture taken in the living room, but I never knew that one day, that same picture will turn out to be a, a copy, <laughs> a copy on a, in yeah. a book. So I am very happy and very pleased about that. Yeah. So Perdita, what do you remember about that day? Yeah, that was, so I remember um, the woman who, she was elderly, her name was Miss Helen. She wore a helmet, and I think looking back now, we think she had Parkinson's. So she, she it was a really small little bungalow, because my mom was taking care of her, she, we were living with her. So my mom and I were in one room on a bed, and then Helen lived in another room on a bed. And so I remember my mom whipping out chains and <laughs> necklaces, and putting my shoes on, and I'm dressing up, she's, like, she's taught me how to smile too, you smile like this. You smell like this? You smell like this? Yeah, she taught me exactly how to smell. It paid off. Listen! <laughs> the lessons. Hello! It, clearly, right? Very fabulous. Yes, very fabulous. Who yeah. knew? Crazy. So, so Miss Kathy, I mean, tell me about how you feel knowing that people will be able to read your story. Well, I am happy that um, the story is out because I wanted to tell that story a long, long time to help other women that are in abusive um, relationship. Yeah. But when Perdita came to me and asked me permission to put our story out, I was willing to do so, and I gave her the permission so that someone can see what went on, so that they themselves can go and get help to help themselves, so that they don't have to stay in an abusive relationship. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. Come a little closer to me, Mom. I feel like you're so far when we talk about this stuff. Can, mm -hmm. I, can I cinch my of mama course. closer to me? Thank you. Get in there. Come in. Thank I love you. you. I love you too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Love you, Mama. You know, <sighs> Kathy, I mean, you bring up some of those difficult moments. Um, uh, as a newcomer to Canada, yeah. working as a domestic worker, raising a family. Um, Perdita, you have a, a piece of, of your memoir that you'd like to share. Would you like to do that now? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready to share this. So this part, um, it's about two and a half minutes long, so everyone just kind of get comfy, get cozy, but it really is... Um, my mom is pregnant with me. She's nine months pregnant. Uh, she's living in Oshawa in the basement of an elderly couple who are wealthy, who she lives and works for. Um, she's asked for time off during her pregnancy, almost like a maternity leave, but they haven't really granted that to her. So literally right up until the moment I get here, she, my mom is working for them. So this is the scene of when my mom goes into labor. Um, so can you hold my fancy bookmark for me, mom? <laughs> um, okay. A tightening sensation in the pit of Catherine's abdomen woke her in the early mornings toward the end of August. She climbed two flights of stairs to Mrs. Harry's bedroom. I have to go to the hospital. The baby is coming early, she whispered through the woman's closed door, trying not to wake her husband, who was asleep in his own room down the hall. I thought you said you weren't due until September. Why does the baby have to come today? Mrs. Harry murmured before falling silent. Catherine didn't have a social network. She simply grabbed hold of the people she encountered along her way. The list of acquaintances she could rely on was short, and it changed as often as the colors of a mood ring. When Mrs. Harry found her labor too inconvenient to bother getting up for, Catherine rang a woman named Joyce. Joyce was about 15 years older, 
from Barbados and had once worked for the Harrys. Mrs. Harry's sister-in-law mentioned to Joyce that Abigail Harry had just hired a young St. Lucian woman and Joyce had rung the house to say hello. Having lived through all of Abigail Harry's antics, she knew the young lady might need support from time to time. You don't stress yourself, Joyce told her now. You go take your shower, then call a taxi. Miss Abby got to learn to fix your own breakfast today. As Catherine waited for the taxi to arrive, she heard cautious footsteps making their way down the basement stairs. Mrs. Harry entered her bedroom. There was a taxi cab in the driveway, she said. Yes, I called one to take me to the hospital. Nonsense, I shoot him off, I can take you. Catherine had barely looked at her boss. She was too busy breathing through her pain. You know what, Catherine? I just looked in the fridge. We have nothing to eat. Catherine struggled to stuff items into her hospital bag. Could you be a dear and make us some tuna sandwiches before we leave for the hospital? As the eruptions in Catherine's abdomen worsened, she climbed the stairs and made 10 tuna sandwiches. She cut each one into four squares and freed them of their crust. Then she wrapped them in damp cloths and placed them in the freezer. No request was a surprise anymore. Wow. I will say that reading that passage really gave me goosebumps. And how does it feel hearing your, your daughter? It's a true story, it is true. <laughs> I'll never forget that day. Hmm. It's okay, Mama. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It was hard for me. It was hard. But I finally, she finally took me to the hospital. And <laughs> instead of I do all the talking. She was, uh, she was the one doing all the talking to the nurse. Yes. Oh, when you showed up at the hospital? <laughs> Remember that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are many other challenging moments, but Ms. Kathy, you know, throughout it all, you are so resilient. How, how did you get through those moments? I went through this because, through it because of the love and the thought of my children mm. and the better life that I want for them that I didn't have. So I went through all what I went through for my kids. Love you. Love you. I sacrificed things to make a better life for them. And you did. You did. You did great, Mama. Mm -hmm. You did great. It worked. It paid off. So we're here today yeah. to celebrate, and you know, yeah. so many wins. Yeah. Um, your daughter's career, mm -hmm. and uh, and and what do you hope people will get out of your story? What I would like people to get out of that story, and there is more in the in the book. But the main for me, mm -hmm. main story for me is that if you are in a bad relationship. And it is not working. <laughs> You're not supposed to stay in an abusive relationship. There are places where you can go mm -hmm. and get help. Yeah. There are Dini's house through them that I get the help. Yeah. And all what I went through, when they called me and helped me out, it was the greatest thing for me. Mm -hmm. Moved me to, from Oshawa forget all about all what I went through and then move to Osh to Pickering to make a better life. A fresh start. Fresh start for fresh my start. children. And that's where God blessed me to raise all my children. Mm -hmm. I didn't have no money. I didn't have no home. Mm -hmm. I didn't have nothing. Yeah. When I moved to the unit that they blessed me with, it was just a broom that it was I empty. had. It was no Empty. bed, nothing for the kids, just the clothes that I put mm -hmm. in the bag, garbage bag, mm -hmm. and bring it with me. Nothing at all. Yeah. Until now, God bless us, and I'm happy with my children, and I said, I'm going to make my, make my kids proud. We're proud. And I... I'm and, so proud, Mama. And, 
I did what I had to do mm -hmm. through God and the love of my children. Yeah. So proud of you, mommy. I love you. I love you. So, so proud of you. It's very yeah. clear that your your children are all proud of you. Mm -hmm. um, and Miss Kathy, you bring up the Denise house yeah. and and how that was a, a turning point in your life, in Perdita's life, in, in yes. your your family's life. Um, and Perdita, you've chosen to donate some of the proceeds from your book yeah. to the Denise house. So yeah. tell me a bit of what went into that decision, why you, you wanted to do that. Yeah, so we got to the Denise house. My mother, we were living in Oshawa. You know, my father was abusive towards my mom. She had no idea that there was help. She had no idea that we, there was a safe place to go. Our house wasn't safe all the time. Uh, some days they were safe if my dad was in a good mood. If he was in a bad mood, it wasn't safe. And um, uh, one night, I remember it was a fight between my, my sister and my mom and my dad. And I was too young. I was probably, oh, maybe six or seven years old and uh, couldn't really intervene. And the police showed up. My dad ran away. But someone came and took us all to the Denise house. And we showed up on their doorstep really with nothing. So all these years later, Denise house is what changed the trajectory of our life because it gave my mother a home. It gave her... Uh, a way to stop the cycle because she no longer had to be oppressed or underneath my dad's thumb and she could call the shots. So literally when we were in our house, there was nothing in our house. I mean, the fridge and the stove, yes, but maybe just a broom and a few things that, that dad let us take. But most of the things he didn't let us take. So Denise's house for me, the reason a portion of everything I make is going to this place is because it was our sanctuary, right, for those months that we stayed there. I remember going into the fridge and opening up the fridge and seeing so much food. I was a greedy little girl. And I was like, there's all this food in a fridge, like how? And even when I was writing the book and I told you I was researching and contacting people who knew us, Sandra McCormick, the woman who met us in 1987 of November, is the same woman who I called when I started working on the book in 2014. She said, Pranita, I was the one who greeted you, your mom and your sister. My mom was pregnant at the time as well when we fled. And uh, I'm on the phone and it was her. And it was just like, pfft, my mind was blown. So the sense of gratitude that I have to that uh, woman's shelter is, um, it's huge, it's immense for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we see that it was a, a huge pivot in your yeah. lives at that point. Um, and uh, a really important moment as well for you, Miss Kathy. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, Perdita, you bring up your father and yeah. you, you write about this relationship. It's very complex yeah. for different reasons, as you mentioned, uh, you know, because of his treatment towards your mother. And, yeah. and uh, so when you decided to write this, um, what was what was his response you know what he's the last person i told that i was writing this so when i decided to do this in september of 2013 i had the idea before but that's when i knew i was actually going to start because i just retired from racing and i called my entire family at my older sister's house who's in the book vonette and i said i have this idea i want to write this book it's on my heart it's been on my heart what do you say Everyone gave me their blessing. For years, my dad didn't know I was writing this book. Until finally, I'm like, oh my gosh, this thing is actually happening. Like someone bought it and Penguin Random House bought it, I should say. It's gonna be out there. I confront, I didn't confront him. Is that the word? It felt like a confrontation, but I finally had to tell him because time was running out. And I think he was really concerned about me writing it. And you see how that scene unfolds in the book. I write about it. But it's hard to tell your story when you know you're gonna hurt somebody else. But I could not skirt over those parts that I witnessed my dad, you know, turning off the water in our house as a way to punish my mother. I lived mm -hmm. through that. I could not not tell those parts because it's not telling the complete truth. And so I love my father. He's a complicated man. He knows I love him. He loves me. We love each other. And I did not do this to hurt him. And I hope he doesn't feel hurt. I doubt he will read it. And I think if he reads it, he probably won't tell me that he's read it. Um, but I feel like I had to tell our truth as women and as a mother and daughter and as a family. And that is our truth. And that is our truth. And how is your relationship with him today? It's good. It's better. And here's the thing. Here's the hard part about going, you know, 30 plus years in the past. My dad is really not that man. And if you think about people who, you know, who we know, we're complicated. We're not always good and we're not always bad. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, evil is a whole different level of evil. But I think people evolve and they grow. And if we don't give them the chance to evolve and they grow, I mean, why are we here? It doesn't excuse his behavior. It doesn't excuse what he did. It was horrible, it was wrong, it shaped me, it scarred me, it, it scarred us all. Um, but my dad is no longer that person and I love my dad, so I always choose to just start there, that mm -hmm. I love him. Wow. So, of course, you know, this is a memoir. It's an inter intergenerational yeah. family story, but it's also about your journey as an athlete. Yeah. And, you know, what I found interesting was that the hurdles seemed, uh, you know, a thing that you were just really good yeah. at, and, but you seem to be running away from the sport 
and, and, and at some point, you just always end up back at it. So, Tashana, you're so this is the motivator here. <laughs> motivator or nagger? Like, <laughs> I know you can't say it, but I can. Yeah. yeah, she encouraged me. She uses the word encourage, but she was really, really on me because I quit for two years. Mm -hmm. I quit for two years. I explain why in the book, a lot of reasons. But um, for me, I didn't um, want to do it. And if she did not nag me for two years to go back, I wouldn't have gone back and found the sport. And so for me, when I look at all the things I've accomplished, Tashana, like, 10 times this, two times this, four times this. It's like, that would have not been possible without her. What's also complex about having written this book is I know the decisions my mother made as a young woman, as a mother, as a woman, and I wouldn't have made a lot of the, those decisions. And so when I think about the fact that I'm still here because she chose to, um, to give me life and say, I'm gonna do this even if it's hard. It's hard and it's, it's such a complicated thing, right, going back in time. Everything that I achieved, I'm like, what if she had made a different decision? Like, I can't help but think that as I write and even as I go back and read the story, what if my mother had made a different decision? And I think anyone like me who goes back and you look at your origin story, I mean, some of them are wonderful and beautiful. And my, my parents loved each other and I was wanted. And I'm like, okay, thank you very much. But, you know, mine wasn't like that. Mine wasn't, you know, mine was a little bit messier. And so as I would race and compete, the reason I wanted to do my mom proud is because I know she didn't have to keep me. And I would never, ever, knowing you know, what her life has been, add to the list of hardships for her. That was, I knew I was so perceptive as a five and six year old, you know, on my own for a lot of times when she was working, I was like, I'm not gonna be on the list of things that makes mom's, mom cry. And so you know, even till this day, I'm always looking at ways where you know, my mom, you know, we all just wanna make you proud, yeah. And I loved some of those moments. I think the, the first time, Miss Kathy, that you saw Perdita race. And, you know, she was, I think, in elementary school, and you came there, and you were so proud of your daughter. Yes. When did you know that she was going to go on and do great things in, in the world of sport? Well, um, when, uh, when we were living in Pickering, um, every year they celebrate um, the unit where we live, they always have a celebration of the opening. So they had a little track and field for the kids around in the gully. Among all the children running, but it came first and I didn't think nothing about it. I didn't study about it. Then we went to, pick, to um, Oshawa Picnic, um, excuse me, Cricket Club had a picnic. So they had a little track and field for the kids. Among all the children again, but it came first. But I never knew, because I never heard anything about track and field. Mm -hmm. Never have that in, um, in the family. So um, one day she came, I was in the kitchen sweeping, and she came to me and said, Mom, I made it for the team. So I said, what team are you talking about? What yeah. is it? What are you talking about? Then I didn't go that day and see her run. She came first, she came for a little red ribbon, yeah. says first. The following year, she came back again and said, Mom, I made it again for the team. I said, well, I'll have to go and see for myself. <laughs> so I went to Oshawa, see all the mothers sitting down there with their umbrellas and in the hot sun. And I, I saw some of, some of her schoolmates and I sat with them. And they're telling me, but it's going to run in a minute. But it's going to You're run. You're so in excited. Minute. Yeah, I was yeah, so happy. Was so excited, then yeah. I saw the little short little girl passing by, and she noticed me and she waved at me. Mm -hmm. And then it was the 100 meters she was running. Yeah. Then among all the kids again, but it came first. I beat them all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're saying I just kicked all the yeah, butts. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah. Did. <laughs> she did. She did. <laughs> Number yeah. one again. She, yeah. she did. That's right. In all the races, she, mm -hmm. you know, and and that's when you knew. And that's when I knew that's that knew. she was gifted. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Miss yeah. Kathy, you were there for the the good moments and the not so good moments. Yes. The, the big races, the the little races. Yeah throughout her, her career. Mm -hmm. And Perdita, you have another passage that you want to share. I do. Around the time when yeah. you went to Athens mm -hmm. in 2004. Yeah. So yeah, that, what you just said is right. My mom was there for the big races. She was there for the little races, all the ones in between. So yeah, this last reading is, um, it's for my sport fans, right? Just to tell you that there are a lot of sport moments in this book. And so um, this passage that I'm about to read, it's basically, 
you know, everyone knows this, but I'll tee it up again. You know, I was the favorite, you know, coming into the 2004 Olympics in the hurdles. Uh, reigning world champion in the final. Hadn't really lost a race all summer leading up to the Olympics. And at the Olympic final, I fall. So I take you through that moment. I take you to the build of that, of that moment. But here and now, I actually want to take you into the immediate aftermath of that moment. Um, and again, this is now another, you know, two or three minute read. But, you know, we'll back, buckle up and we'll be fine. Um, but just to give you a sense. So in this, at this point, I've gone through the mix zone, the whole media, you know, thing, media around the world asking me about this one moment. And now this is, you know, I've walked through the mix zone. When I finally spotted Dr. Kelsick at the edge of the media area, away from the glare, the levee broke. He was the first true friend I had seen since my nightmare began. I didn't recognize my own cry when I saw him. Long, guttural sounds that only broke as my lungs begged for air. Dr. Kelsick tried to pick me up. I was a crumpled mass on the cool marble floor. I finally stood up, but I lost strength after every few steps and kept collapsing. This happened again and again, until the only thing Dr. Kelsey could do was drag me. Drag me like a sandbag through the winding hallway of that Greek stadium in desperate search for an empty room to house my devastation. The tools I had at my disposal to make my mother smile had evolved from good manners to good grades to good races. What I felt I had lost that day wasn't just a gold medal. It was a powerful, triumphant marker that would show mom just how far we had come. It made my spirit sink that I had let it pass us by. My family had been watching live with news crews crammed into mom's tiny living room. Vonette, my older sister, had preferred that only our family watch live, but mom couldn't find it in her heart to refuse all the outlets that wanted to watch the race with them and capture their reaction. My family was wearing personalized t-shirts Nike had made. Oversized satellite trucks had sat outside our townhouse. Kids from my complex held signs near the co-op entrance, asking cars zipping past to honk their support for me, and they had. I didn't know any of this when someone called mom for me and then handed me the phone in the room Dr. Dr. Kelsick had found. She answered from 5,000 miles away. I had no doubt that she would. It felt like someone had opened a window in a room overrun with smoke. I breathed her in. Dry your eyes, Pradeet, Mom said gently. I was startled by how good she sounded. Why isn't she crying? You are the gold, my darling. You hold your head high. You hear me? It felt like she was funneling into me the strength and positivity that she held on to no matter the situation from leaving her tropical home behind, working arduous jobs for meager pay, and being in an abusive relationship to fighting for us all to be together and believing we could make it in Pickering on our own. Mom had always smiled and believed through it all, and she was doing that now for me. It took the edge off my pain. I didn't have the gold, but I had her. Thank you. Wow, that was so beautiful. Thanks to Shauna. When you, you know, read that and you look back at that time yeah. through today's lens, mm -hmm. how do you feel about it? You know what, I, it's hard because I don't revisit Athens very much and I had to confront it in that book. Of course, if I'm living my life and someone remembers, remembers me based on that, then I, I confront it. But very rarely do I go back and reflect in this moment and who I am now today, um, I realize that that moment for me was symbolic. It was, it, was the, it was the top of the pyramid in track and field. There is no higher, right? That was it for track and field. And to me, that was the ultimate status symbol that we had made it. We had made it through the sneers. Mom, you had done well. There was now a tangible object and a title to go along with it, to prove it. I think we, know, we knew that privately, but it was almost that public kind of um, showing of it that I really wanted. And here's the thing, as an athlete, I'm not thinking like, win this race for mom, that, like, I mean, that's corny, no one does that, right? But it was a more what I knew this would mean to us, right? And I know mom would question herself through the years of if she made the right choices, did she do the right thing? You know, a few of my siblings were in St. Lucia without her, while her and I were in Canada alone, she trying to make it work to bring them. And I know that caused her a lot of pain to be without her, her own children. And maybe just being with me, you know, the way we imprint and we interface, and the others aren't with her, and they're impressionable and need her. And so for me, that moment was, mom, we're good. 
we got this, we made it. And I knew my, my family and my siblings would feel that too. So when I lost that moment, I felt like I'd lost something just really monumental. But looking back and I reveal it in the pages, I don't necessarily feel that today, although Athens will always be the thing that got away from me, but I'm, I've made some sort of peace with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And Kathy, how do, you, how do you feel about what happened back then today? Well, it was really hard for me the second time, <coughs> excuse me, when, um, when I really realized that Bolita lost. The next day, I felt as if that someone passed away in the family. It was so lonely, and I was a single mother. No one to talk to. Mm. <laughs> I know, Mama. It was really tough. Thinking that she fell, and she's all alone, and I was not even there to hold her. To tell her I love her and comfort her from falling. You know I felt it, right? You know I knew you were there. I knew you were there, Mom. I knew and you were this there. time I look in the book and see how she fell and all the, the hurdle bars all over her. It was so, it was tearing me apart. I love you, Mama. But I'm glad. Through it all, she was okay. Mm -hmm. That was the main thing. And mm -hmm. like she mentioned, I said, darling, you are the gold. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, because God knows best. God knows best. And look, and look at where she is today. Mm -hmm. She didn't stop us. No, she didn't, didn't stop yeah. us. That Thank moment, God. as yeah. you say, it, it didn't define you, no. who you are, where you were going to go. Yeah. What advice would you have for yeah. athletes who are, you know, maybe headed to the Olympics this year yeah. or facing, you know, uh, dealing with maybe a disappointment. Yeah, and what a time in human history, right? Like, to prepare for, like, an Olympic Games the way it is, like, not full preparations, places cold, you can't be with your coach. You know, I would say to them, you know, you just can only prepare as best you can, right? And I think I had even Olympians calling me and saying, what do I do? Do I go? Do I put it on hold? More the older ones who 2020 was going to be the end. Looking back... Because, you know, I'm 40 now. I'm full grown. <laughs> Looking back on my, like, 13-year career, um, you don't get that time back. Mm. You don't get it back. And one thing I do wish that I had done differently is smelled the roses a little bit more deeply. Just stopped and, like, just breathed it all in. Because you're always looking for, like, what's next, what's next, what's next? Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, what is now? This moment is here and now. And do you ask me to run a hurdle today, Tashana. Not happening. <laughs> 1246 where? Like, I'm not, you know? Like, thank God my Canadian record is still there, but I don't have it. Mm -hmm. And so the point of me saying that is to athletes who are going to the Olympics in Tokyo, just hang on tight. Live this chapter however it looks and enjoy it because one day you'll be on the other side. You'll be 40, 40 and old, but you'll be 40 <laughs> and you'll look back at that time and be like, wow, did I, did I live it up enough? So mm -hmm. you do it so you have no regrets is what I'm saying. Okay, so we have your very first fan, but I hear someone, uh, your youngest fan, yes. your daughter Nova. I can hear her. Can you hear her? Yeah, can we, can, is, I believe Nova wants to join us let's on see set. She's in the mood. Yeah, let's see okay. if Nova's in the mood. Nova, Nova, do you want to come join us? Come on. Oh. Hi, baby. Aww. Yes. Thank you, baby. Hello, Nova. Hi, Nova. Hi, baby Nova, girl. Can you say bye to daddy and say wow. hi to Shauna and grandma? Hello, beautiful. Yes. Hi, Nova. Do you like it? How hi, are you? Shana. You look so pretty. Yeah. Yes. Hi, hi Nova. Hi, grandma. Oh, she's hi, how are you? <laughs> oh, she is so happy to see grandma, too. Yes. Hi, grandma. Wow. Look at the love. Yeah, she's this is a beautiful moment. Yeah, My mother's generations. daughter, three generations here. And you know, Perdita, what, it, yeah. there's, there was a post that you shared yeah. about your journey to motherhood. Yeah. Um, you were very open about mm -hmm. uh, having to go through IVF mm -hmm. treatment and sharing mm -hmm. that. I mean, why was it important for you to shed light on, on that? Yeah, you know, um, I think the reason I wanted to share that picture is Stop the stigma of, you know, women needing help to have a baby. 
it was delayed for me. I was really, you know, started around 37 or 38. My husband and I decided to try. And to me, what was really difficult was I was going through, you know, fertility treatments while writing my mother's daughter. And so it was a completely different thing. And it was a four-year process. So it was the last two years. It was a different experience knowing I'm writing about me and my mother's experience. And then I'm trying to have a baby but can't. Uh, Nova does come into the world, thank God. She's a miracle. She's almost two. But while she was um, about six months old, I was writing the revisions, right? And here's what I will say about that experience. It made the bond between me and my mom stronger. It made me understand why she did what she did. Because This little one right here, like... She's really cute right now, but then she's, you know, she could be a lot. Open the door. Open the door. She wants to go. That means she wants to go. We're almost done, Nova. But I would do anything for her. And I get why my mother would do anything for us. And I understand that. You're over it? You had enough? You want to leave? No, we're almost, we're almost done. So I get it now, and it made me appreciate my mother even more. And I love this little girl because she's really very much a miracle. And... Um, it gave more meaning to my writing, I will say that. I really appreciate uh, mm -hmm. you sharing that. And yeah. of course, uh, it, is, it is nice to know that you'll be able to, to share the story with her yeah. as well. Yeah, well, here's the thing. I didn't really understand how the, the story would end when I was writing. Um, but, you know, the story came together in the last few months because Nova was around. And I knew how to close it up. I knew what I had come to say by then. And it was really, really nice. She gave a lot more meaning to how we ended the story. And we have three generations here. Obviously, I have my siblings. Mom, how many grandkids do you have now? I'm blessed with 15 grandkids 15. and one great granddaughter. They've been busy. My family been busy. Let me Ms. tell Kathy, you. Kathy, you're the queen, I bet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, she is. She is As the queen. As you can bee. see, Nova, love. Yeah. I'm so happy to yes. see you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for opening up and sharing your story. Um, Perdita, I know you have a bit of an announcement that you'd like to share. I do have an announcement. It's a fun announcement. So um, I've partnered with some really amazing brands who really want to support my mother's daughter. They know that the Denise House is such an important um, part of my life and that um, we're giving back in this way. So we're having a giveaway a giveaway contest to get people to, as many people as they can to get their hands on this book. And so essentially we're launching a, a book selfie giveaway contest. So it's mothers and daughters, grab my mother's daughter, take an amazing selfie picture with it, post it on Instagram, Facebook, all over, use the hashtag uh, my mother's daughter giveaway. And every week um, we will be finding a mother daughter duo to send a huge basket of stuff, you know, um, in it. The whole list will be on my Instagram, um, but it's really, really just a fun way to celebrate the book, get more people, you know, to put their hands on it. And really just, it's, it's, a, it's our favorite things in this gift basket. And I promise you will not be disappointed. Okay, Perdita's and Miss Kathy's favorite things. Yes. And maybe Nova's. And maybe Nova's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe Nova's. <laughs> you say hi, Grandma? Nova, did you have anything else to add? Yeah? yeah. You're pretty happy here today, yeah. too. Tickle, 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 tickle. <laughs> so, Perdita, Kathy, there is a small surprise for both of you. A special message from a number of people who wanted to congratulate you Aww. who couldn't be here today. But if you pick up this iPad, you can take a look at what they had to say. Ooh. We've been following your life journey for many years, and uh, we are just so thankful and so humble to call you our friend. Mm. This last accomplishment of yours is just incredible. So congratulations and we look forward to celebrating with you. I would go on to witness countless accomplishments and highlights of her career, uh, winning many races, world championships, and another highlight of being the uh, Canadian Athlete of the Year. I encourage Perdita not to let one race define her. And she has done just mm. that uh, she's journeyed a path that just shows the intestinal fortitude and the belief in herself and the sky is the limit for her. And so I want to say congratulations, Perdita, uh, at the launching of your new book, My Mother's Daughter. The best is yet to come and blessings to you and your family. You know, I'm really thrilled oh, to be Kevin. a small part of it as your uh, teacher and um, as, as, as a mentor and, and as a friend. And it was just a wonderful experience working with you as you were putting this book together. It was, it's really an incredible story. I'm just so excited for you. Um, I feel very privileged to have worked with you. I've learned a ton from you and I've learned a ton from your story and from Kathy's story. You're just such an inspiration in so many ways and working with you has been chief among 
the highlights of you know my being an editor i am so thrilled for you and i can't wait for this incredible book and your empowering story to reach readers everywhere congratulations oh, thanks, Sam. i am so excited for the world to discover what a phenomenal writer you are for them to get to meet you on the page get to know you better and also for them to get to know your mom kathy we at Doubleday are so proud to publish you. Congratulations on this extraordinary achievement. Oh, Mel. Oh. I want to say deeply, personally, thank you for sharing your story, for sharing your mother, Kathy, with us as readers to open our hearts and minds and be inspired as human beings to change, to learn and to grow. Thank you so much and congratulations. The day is finally oh, here. Thanks. Thank you, Clara. Perdita, you are one great dame. And as you blast out of the starting blocks on this, your newest adventure, I want to wish you the very, very best and send you my heartiest congratulations. But what I really want to know is who's going to play you in the movie? Sally. Have a great lunch. <laughs> Isn't that nice? That was really sweet to see Thank that. Thank you. Wasn't that sweet I to really see? I really appreciate that. Yeah, that was really sweet. That was yes. a good surprise. Perdita, Miss Kathy, thank you so much for sharing your words, sharing your story with me. Uh, and I appreciate the invitation to have this moment with you. Tashana, I'm so glad that you agreed to do this. I know how close you are to your mom <laughs> and your story is very similar, right? So I knew this conversation was gonna be amazing with you, so thank you. And to everyone behind the scenes thank that are that is here and helped this vision come to life, thank you. Thank you. Everyone watching, my publishers, my editor, my agents, my husband, my daughter, everybody. And mom, to you most of all, you're an incredible woman to share the story. A lot of mothers wouldn't have said yes. They would have said no. But you know who you are. We love who you, who you are. The world needs more Kathys. But they only get, there's only one and she's mine. So I love you, mama. And I, I love, love you. you too, my daughter. Yes, I love you, mama. Let's take some selfies because, you know, that's how I like to end the show. All right, show us how it's done. All right, let me, <laughs> let me show you something. Let me show you. Because, you know, we have a Capture selfie the moment. contest. That's right. Capture want, the moment. You want to hold the book, mom? Yes. Okay. You can't have a selfie contest without selfies. Mama.